Okay, we're going to jump in. Folks are going to um, casually join us as they can over our lunchtime. Um, I'm very excited for today. Thank you all for joining us and welcome to the seventh webinar in the Civic Commons Catalyst series. Um, my name is Molly. I'm going to be your host and moderator today. I'm a program officer here at Evergreen and I'm contributing to the Civic Commons Catalyst. Um, beside, behind the scenes rather, is um, my colleague Jasmine, who is handling all of the tech support right now. So if you have any questions um, throughout this webinar, uh, she has just shared her email address there. So you can click on that. Um, if you're having issues like hearing um, or, or seeing any of the screens, uh, right now you should be on, you should be viewing our landing page and then everybody's faces or screens around them, sort of Brady Bunch style. Um, so today we're exploring sort of like two fresh perspectives on the Civic Commons Classic, which is the library. Um, and these are, I mean, libraries are often referred to as third spaces for many people. Um, and I feel like in most recent decades, they've really been diversifying what they offer, whether it be multimedia content, sort of like tech forward resources, language courses, social programming, inclusionary programming, and then, of course, a whole world of alternative lending libraries. Libraries for tools, for instruments, um, for kitchen utensils and equipment, comic book libraries, and then um, sharing depots of all sorts. Um, so there's a great resurgence in the sort of uh, third space and protecting libraries as expanded spaces for mobilizing and gathering and for learning. Um, and so I'm really, really excited that Lawrence Alvarez and Osa is, are able to join us today. Um, we're gonna just briefly give some context into what the Civic Commons Catalyst does uh, here at Evergreen. And then I'm going to introduce our speakers a little bit more. They're gonna have an opportunity to share the incredible work that they've been doing at the Toronto Tool Library and the Halifax Public Library. Um, and then we're gonna open the floor for discussion. So we're gonna change things up a little bit from last year, or well, yeah, actually, I guess last year, 2019. Um, if folks want to, I, I really encourage people to turn on their webcams if you're interested, um, partially so I don't feel so lonely, but um, partially it helps to sort of like build up a sense of who is listening in. Um, if you are unable to hear, I just received a comment, Jasmine is working on that. Um, and she'll, she'll respond to that quickly. Um, but great, so let's sort of like situate you in this work. Um, this webinar is part of a larger Civic Commons Catalyst series. Um, the Civic Commons Catalyst is an initiative here at the Future Cities Canada at Evergreen, which offers sort of like a whole slew of programming that supports and scales existing civic initiatives, um, starts to prototype a few new participatory models, and it's supporting activities that are, um, excuse me, uh, resident-led. So that's something that's been developed over the past year. This webinar series will continue for, I think, four more months. Um, we have a lab program that is working on some really incredibly in innovative um, civic commons and community hub uh, collaboration from sort of um, coast to coast to coast and that will wrap in June and then the sort of like larger um, knowledge hub of resources that we're collecting through that lab and through this webinar series are shared on our website. So I'm going to jump into an introduction to our speakers because they are probably the main reason you're here and not for me. Um, uh, Lawrence is a very good friend of mine and more importantly, the co-founder and former executive director of the Toronto Tool Library and the Institute for Resource-Based Economy, which is based here in Toronto. Um, he's a public speaker, project manager, um, really enjoys the challenge of creating community and does it very well, I might add, um, and exploring connections between all of us. He grew up in Zimbabwe and spent 15 years in Canada and now uh, resides in Sweden, which um, we had a conversation on Friday as a team. Turned out to be a surprisingly Swedish conversation because Osa Katchen, uh, the CEO and chief librarian from Halifax Public Library, is also Swedish. Um, I think we'll stick for, 
for today in English, but they may have little um, jokes, which is great and wonderful. And um, I think brings, um, yeah, a real warmth to their connection too throughout today. Um, but OASA has been, um, yeah, a real uh, privilege to work with. And um, I have a huge excitement for her breadth of experience. Um, she manages 450 staff in Halifax and there's over 14 uh, branches. And the uh, central library that was opened in Halifax is sort of like internationally uh, recognized for the care and attention that it brings to really pushing the boundaries and reimagining what a library can be. Um, prior to the library, she was uh, with Dalhousie University for 16 years as vice president, assistant vice president for the enrollment management and registrar, and um, is very, very actively involved with United Way, um, Halifax Stamps, and Halifax Grammar School, and was recently named uh, a Circle of Justice Champion by the Michelle Jean, Jean Foundation. So welcome to both of our speakers. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very, very excited. Um, before we dive into Lawrence's presentation, I'm gonna see, I know folks are probably just grabbing some lunch, um, but if anybody is able to uh, work the chat, I wanted to test to see who is with us in the audience today. So I'm curious if you can use the chat function in your bottom corner um, and type in if anybody is currently an active library user. Somebody who goes to your libraries maybe once or twice every two weeks or so. Awesome. Who here uses libraries for something other than borrowing books? <laughs> Awesome. Feel free to add what you do uh, at the library most often. Kids programming, for sure. Great. Who doesn't know where their closest library is? That's a good sign. No one. <laughs> or no one who will admit it in public. <laughs> Okay, great. Um, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm excited that everybody is here. I looked through the list of folks who were interested in coming and it looks like there's lots of people who are already involved in this work or community centers or libraries and um, we're going to open up the floor for uh, participant engagement and questions after these Pecha Kucha um, presentations so that everybody can add to the sort of breadth of knowledge that we're sharing today. Um, but with that, I'm going to pass it off to Lawrence. Um, and it's all you. You can take it from here. Great. Hello, everyone. I'm really appreciative uh, to Molly and the whole team in Evergreen for, uh, yeah, for inviting me. So uh, I'm just going to dive right in. So uh, the Toronto Tool Library it took its name from you know, other tool sharing projects that we had discovered right at the time in 2012. And they were mainly happening in the U.S. And calling it a library was, of course, like an obvious nod to the act of borrowing and bringing back. But this was and is only the basic function, right? The Toronto Tool Library offers workshops. It's a meeting space for innovation and learning. It's a space to experiment and create. And in this way, it actually shares even more in common with a 2020 library. Um, the Toronto Public Library, which I love and dearly miss, acts more like a community center to me than what I think the image conjured from the word library suggests, right? I think there exists an image of a library embodied as, you know, the big rubber stamp smashing the inside of a huge tome. Um, and it's just not what these spaces are any longer, right? They are hubs. Like at most libraries, you, you get help with homework. You know, it's a place, one of the last in most cities to hang out for free with no expectation of a purchase. We get language cafes that I, learning Swedish, have taken advantage of here at the Gothenburg Public Library. There's meetups, you know, for everything from coding, digital innovation hubs. And I think if there is to be a challenge to ownership, uh, be it like knowledge or actual physical things, it makes sense it would come from an existing, entrenched, and already funded um, institution. 
And that is the challenge that must be overcome, right? Having exclusive, intimate access to all the things involved in the human life that is just incompatible with the physical realities of our planet. And trying to make it so is frankly the strength. Go to the next slide. Um, you know, a side note, since moving to Sweden, actually, I've taken many simple jobs to improve my Swedish and begin building a new life here. And those jobs have mostly been in warehouses. Um, and I will tell you, if you want to feel the horror of consumerism, you just need to walk into a warehouse. There's tons of waste. And this is Sweden, right, which is held up as, as a shining example. And it just showed me that the changes we need uh, are so massive that even a, a place that is held up as a shining example, Sweden, is unable currently to meet those requirements. So it just to me speaks to the, the, the huge challenge that we are sort of facing. Anyway, these alternative le lending environments like the tool library, these sharing hubs, they're not, as I see it, some kind of transition project to reach a better future, right? They are what will exist in a sane society. Right? It's just impossible by any stretched out technological fix that in 100 years, everyone is going to have their own drill, right? I just don't think that's really going out on a limb. It feels far from it, actually. Ownership is it's going to change, whether we adapt gracefully to it or not. And the most graceful adaptation, the kindest, is to interrupt the repetitive creation of seldom used items and instead give them a home in a communal living room. Um, but look, I don't think this solution of resource sharing hubs is going to change the world without some sort of like massive government investment or buying. Being, being on the ground, like building one of these grassroots uh, libraries, it means having to beg for like every single dollar like all the time. And it's tiring. It's unsustainable, and it's really not how it scales, right? And it's also not rocket science, but maybe it's a little bit of like climate science, right? Less making, less wasting. Anyway, you can go to the next slide. Uh, for our project, uh, I think about how did we measure our impact? I was talking to Molly uh, before, and she was sort of saying, you know, maybe this is something you can speak to. Uh, because this is the golden funders question, right? What are our figures? We measure our impact in terms of like loans, number of tools, number of members, but it tells this small and like incomplete picture. And now alternative sharing libraries around the world have done this massive work in creating measurement tools to show the relation between borrowing and a reduction in GHGs. There are also these alternative lending libraries that are sprouting up all over the world, and it's like this growing movement. Right? There must be over 300 of these formal lending libraries in the world by now in like 300 cities. And I even feel like that's kind of conservative. Um, the stats are, are kind of hard to find, but the, anyway, there's many, many, many of these things. Uh, we had a symposium, actually, a, a lending library symposium, the first in the world. Um, in 2017, we all gathered in Baltimore and there was uh, 17 libraries, 17 alternative lending libraries came there and we talked about best practices and this is all the huge group of volunteers doing this, right? So it really speaks to the inspiration that these kinds of projects bring. And we actually hosted the next year a the Lending Library Symposium in Toronto. Um, and we had about 20 lending libraries from around Canada and the US and international. We had the Netherlands and Edinburgh come over too. So anyway, it's really, uh, it's really inspirational. But, in these projects, the impact is really tough to measure because you cannot measure like how a heart swells or there's no metric for like smiles and appreciation. So anyway, we can talk about that later if you want, but that's, uh, that has always been the challenge for the library from day one is measuring its impact. Um, now, one of the biggest realizations from my time with the tool library was that the kind of person who wants to do something positive for the world has extreme variation. Among them, there are builders, there are carpenters, there are plumbers, electricians, and makers uh, who want to participate in that positivity. I was used to seeing changing the world as a generally administrative task, but that also involved some food things, right? But anyway, the tool library really opened my eyes.
it gives so many people the chance to participate by loaning tools or helping to restore and fix tools or by teaching other folks their DIY tricks. Like there is such a tremendous effort necessary to turn the societal container ship that it's worth the effort to create opportunities for everyone to get involved. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, there is this, um, this uh, older gentleman. Oh, this is a picture of me. Flip. Can we go to the next slide? <laughs> oh, no. Okay. I, uh, I have a bit more to say, so I'm going to carry on saying that. That picture is so funny when I think about it. Thinking of looking. Anyway, I just want to tell you a couple stories. There's this 70 year old gentleman. His name is Frank Kaufman. And he began attending these weekly community nights that we had at our makerspace. And he was really hungry to do something, like one conversation with this man that tells you he's a teacher. So he began teaching these drywall workshops for free at our space for the opportunity to meet people and share the wealth of knowledge that he had accumulated. And honestly, that man, he taught me the language of drywall mud. You know? <laughs> anyway, these places, they act like these chair community hubs, and they are community owned. Like we have three locations of the tool library, but we moved one of them in 2018. We had to close one that existed in our east side. For, we had an east side location, and it existed there for five years. And we had to we had to close it down, unfortunately, because of reasons completely out of our control. And people were really disappointed. At the time, I was like, "Look, we did the best we could. You win some battles, and you really lose others." Um, but the further truth is that we moved a location that was theirs. They owned that location. That community owned that location. That community needed that location. It was literally impossible to stay, but it really was like breaking up with our community. And I think it came with all the same emotions, right? Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, hopefully some acceptance. But to be honest, those emails, they still uh, haunt me a little bit. Anyway, some days I feel like the container ship of it is turning, right? We're moving towards these things, uh, these positive projects that will that we obviously require in order to secure a livable future on this miraculous planet that we we live upon. But the change required sometimes it feels on the scale of like a World War II mobilization, right? And I think that common ownership it can really take a lot of pressure off all of the all of the other things that need to happen. Right. And I think that either public libraries start their own sharing hubs, right? for sure many have, and there's amazing things happening, you know, or they can take over those that already exist. Right? You nationalize the sharing economy. You build it into community. You make it like a, you make the choice a no-brainer. You serve it up on a silver platter. Because people, I think they're struggling in general, and having a hub that saves them money while at the same time forwarding the obviously necessary vision of future Earth that is a breath of fresh air to communities that both need the actual resources, but it's also an inspiration and it gives a bit of hope. The last thing I want to say, man, I was thinking about this library, uh, talking to librarians. Man, I love librarians. Holy cow, you people have changed my life for the better. So many ways, but I was thinking about how, like, you know, if we continue to live on Earth as we are now, consuming these resources beyond our means, we are borrowing from the future. And you know what you do when you borrow and you don't return? You gotta pay those late fees. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. I feel like that is the perfect pass off to the chief librarian of Halifax Public Library. So, um, Osa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I noticed I was going through the lineup of participants. I want to say a special shout out to my colleagues, Allison and Laurel and Curtis and Debbie, who have all signed in. I think before I even begin the presentation, this isn't my personal story as much as it's our collective story. So we have an amazing team at this library that is making great things happen. So everything I talk about that Halifax Public Libraries has done is really driven by a team who have great vision for the direction we wanna go. Hi, Curtis. <laughs> Curtis just typed in a little hi to me. Okay, let's get started. Uh, we at Halifax Public Libraries are really interesting case study um, because we are a library system that 
was formed 20 years ago by the merger of three disparate systems um, at the merger of Halifax Regional Municipality. And, and we, but we have also gone through a tremendous shift that really began with, with uh, you know, with the time leading up to the opening of our central library and certainly the five years that follow. So next slide, I'm going to start with, oh, there it is. Okay, this was the beginning of my library story. This was shortly after we emigrated to Canada from Sweden. And, uh, you know, I put this slide in to say almost everybody, I'm sure, who is on this chat, because nobody said they don't use their library, can think back to what that experience was when they began. And there are certain things that libraries hold true. Uh, you know, free, available to all. Uh, there is a core part of our libraries, which are related to literature and literacy and, and language and culture. Um, and for us as new immigrants to Canada, this was, this was really where we settled in when we got to know the, our community. So if we flip to the next slide, now my childhood experience was Saskatoon, but this was the old Halifax Memorial Library in Halifax, which sits diagonally across the street from our new central library. It is not unlike libraries across Canada, and it was opened in the 50s, but it was not sort of mid-century modern. It was built with stature to reflect the, the stature of the public library. But um, almost immediately after it opened, I think there was an acknowledgement that the, it, it wasn't necessarily very future-proof. So, uh, you know, very marble floors, you walk in, there are staircases. It's a very, very formal space. and. Uh, my predecessors worked long and hard to lead us to uh, what eventually became the opening of our new central library across the street at uh, five years ago. The, this library in its latest years had you know, just under 400,000 visits a year. I'll give you the bombshell number for the new library shortly. Uh, some of that is definitely related to space, but I think a lot of it is related to how we transformed our relationship with our community. So if we flip to the next slide, uh, there was significant consultation with our community ahead of the opening of Central that invited this combination about, or this conversation about what, what actually is our community seeking. And what I love about this is the words that are, are expressed in this, attached to this rendering of the architects, is really about the, it speaks to community. So when we talk about the conversations Evergreen has, you know, today we're talking about those values in the context of the library, but those are all values that reflect a thriving community. So are we welcoming? Is there serendipity? You know, are we, do we invite diversity exploration? Are we green? You know, how do we create the spaces that actually change how we feel? So if you flip to the next slide, um, this is sort of what the, you know, this is what it looked like. Uh, this is a photo taken just ahead of opening. I know it's time dated because it has an American apparel store across the street. And of course they're not in Canada anymore. Um, so we really visually and architecturally landed in a place that was very different from the past. And I think the challenge for us internally was to say, how do we change and capitalize on every opportunity that comes with this public attention on the public library? Because ahead of opening, there were people who would have said, you know, not really sure we need a library in the age of Google. And we knew we had about a 12 to 18 month window to totally change their mind. So next slide. So this is a photo that was taken of the crowd that was gathering outside the library on the first day of opening. You'll notice they're carrying safety scissors. So we wanted this to be a different experience. We were actually handing out scissors to the people who were gonna be entering the library, which is a big trust exercise. And what we really wanted was instead of dignitaries cutting the ribbon, that, that the public would cut the ribbon because this was their library. They were not outside observers on an on a unveiling of a public building. This was actually gonna be a public building that was their public building and their home. So they were the starring, you know, the stars of the day. And uh, we had 400 pairs of scissors. People came early, early, early. And I, five years later, people tell me they still have their little piece of ribbon from the day they cut the ribbon to their public library. So we'll click quickly to the next slide, which really shows the crowd. And if you look at the faces of the people, there was a wow. And wow was one of those words that people were, were seeking. So let me talk to you about all the things that we've been able to do to retain that wow. So on that first day, we had about 15,000 people who came through the door. Remember I told you we had 390,000 or so at the old library. First year, we had just under 2 million visits and we have settled in five years later, we're still sitting about 1.5 million visits per year. So this was not, a, I'm gonna check it out and I'm now I've seen it and I don't need to come back. This has become 
we're in a city with a population of 400,000. This has become part of people's lives. And this is just one branch of our 14 branches. So it actually has changed and elevated the life of all of our branches. Uh, people remembered why the library was there and we leveraged. Okay, let's keep moving. We gotta move it a little more quickly. So we, if I can sum it up in, a, in terms of the space, it's about giving the public ownership. And I'll do next slide quite quickly. So Jasmine, if you wanna click through. So we create spaces, you'll see people with their feet tucked up. We've created the invitation for different kinds of work. We have quiet work. Uh, it's one of those places you can be alone in the public space. Next slide. It's also the place where we tackle tough topics. So it might be cultural, so it might be a book launch, but it might also be how we try to, to figure out, you know, how we approach reconciliation with our First Nations, how we address uh, racism in our community, where are our failings on, on healthcare or climate, Let's really talk about those in the public context because we, I'll talk a little bit later about polarization. Next slide. Uh, it might be things that people never thought would happen in a library. Certainly my childhood library, I could never have imagined Pac-Man. And you know, now we have all kinds of uh, Minecraft and, and FIFA soccer. But of course, libraries are all about drawing people in. And, and I was a bookish child who was drawn in by the literature, but literature doesn't draw kids in who would still benefit from the values of this place. And we want them to embed themselves. So gaming crosses languages, technology. Uh, we have, this is a, you know, tech doing some coding and, and uh, getting a bit of a sound board going with various kinds of fruit. Uh, but you know what, it's anything with 3D printers, it's sewing, it's, it's uh, how to grow plants. Let's continue on to the next slide. Uh, it is about the creation of knowledge as much as the consumption of knowledge. So how are we offering our community opportunities to create? The, we have uh, music recording studios. There are wonderful podcasts that have found their home in the library. Uh, Friday afternoons, we have public jamming. So we have instruments in the house, just drop by. It's a great place. We have international students who attend university nearby who couldn't bring an instrument with them across the globe, but they land at the library and the music becomes a point of contact. Um, next slide. And of course, it's a lot about being and being with neighbors. And I, I love the shot of the children's area because it's as much about the parents as it is about the babies. It's how do we reduce the loneliness that comes with parenthood, uh, particularly parenthood of young children. And where are we going to create those public places where people bump into each other within the public domain and where friendships can come? Uh, friendships can develop. So increasingly, and this is a new thing that we've moved toward, uh, this slide and the next slide are both pictures of some of our outdoor library spaces. So there would have been a time, you know, in this case, this current slide is uh, our Dartmouth North Library. We turned a wall of the library into sliding glass doors and we built an amazing community deck in a neighborhood where people live in apartments and have limited access to green space. The plants we planted bear fruit. The, uh, we have family movie nights with 400, 500 people. We have outdoor karaoke midweek um, and there are opportunities for physical activity and, and we trust the public to take the materials in and out. And our great experience has been, you create beautiful spaces, you really hand over that ownership and you trust your public to care for the things that belong to them and, and they don't let you down. So it is so much about leveraging these sort of equitable public spaces for the public good. So next slide. Um, and of course food. So not only can people bring their coffee into the library and their lunch and maybe order a pizza, we teach a lot about food. And we have, uh, this is a photo of Emily, who's our food literacy coordinator. She, she does food safe programming for newcomers, so it opens up job opportunities for them because they have the credentialing and it helps them understand what's available in the market here in our country that is, is local and can be, can be leveraged. Next slide is from our newcomer cooking club. You know, we, in the public space, that knowledge sharing often becomes the people who hold knowledge, um, love to share their knowledge. And it is truly uh, food that we are finding food is, there's both a food literacy element, uh, but also the food is a great opening for, for sharing stories and building community. So if we move on, I think that the second, so that's really about the creation of the space and the life that we also have this amazing sharing infrastructure. We have databases that hold records, we have RFID, we have the technology and the um, uh, understanding to share. And 
we're looking at new ways of leveraging that infrastructure. And Debbie, who's on the line, looks after our team who, who is responsible for these things. So I wish you had her mic on, Debbie. Uh, but we'll flip through a few of these just to give you an idea of where are the edges. So courses, books, audiobooks, um, ebooks. But a few, as of a few years ago, it was musical instruments. We have light therapy lamps, both within our libraries for people to try, um, and also that they can borrow to take home. Uh, again, it's not an inexpensive um, product. It may have a really positive impact on somebody's health, um, but let's, uh, you know, let's take it, you know, let's give people a chance to try it out before they buy it. Radon detectors, big health issue in Nova Scotia, second leading cause of lung cancer is radon that comes out of our bedrock. These tools from the public library can help people know and make the adjustments. Next slide, uh, we've worked with Autism Nova Scotia. We have autism toolkits, so families who are grappling with autism, take home a bunch of tools and see what works in your home before you go out to buy things. And then if you do buy one or two, you know what to buy and you board them at, at no cost. The free element is a lovely starting point. Uh, let, it all comes back to, of course, what's it all for the sake of? And I think this is probably where the heart of our conversation should be. And uh, I'll give you just an idea of the kinds of things that we think about when we make decisions about what should we lend? How do we open up our spaces to everyone? Uh, next slide. So this is really an image from our, our strategic plan. Our, our community sits in the middle and, and we have all kinds of ways of sharing knowledge and vibrant spaces and encouraging social and economic growth. But the truth is it's all ultimately about a thriving community. And if we as an organization can sort of free ourselves of bureaucracy and push our boundaries and find a way to say yes to the things that our community needs, um, we're really gonna do our best to achieve that. Uh, the next slide, um, you know, uh, we'll flip through these quickly. I think it's important to think about our public spaces and our buildings with re in reflection of how people feel at their home. So this is a study that came out in 2016 about people's expectations around privacy and comfort and their reality. And the way people are living these days, sometimes they need that public space because they don't actually feel at home at home. So the statistics around uh, particularly 18 to 35 year olds in terms of couch surfing and mi migrating, uh, we need public spaces where people can settle in and feel healthy and good and connected. Um, and that's, you know, there are many studies, but this is just, just one. The next slide is really about the civil discourse. So one of the challenges of technology is it algorithms can feed back to us the perspective we already held, right? So I get fed things from The Guardian and The New York Times. I don't get fed things from Fox News. So it's really easy for me to believe that everybody in the world has the perspective that I have. And it's really important for us to figure out how we bump up against each other and, uh, and challenge one another and, and find our common ground as, a, as, a, as local communities, but also as a global community. And of course, social determinants of health. There's really nothing that happens in the public library um, that is not ultimately about the health and well-being. And we know we are learning more about the impact of social isolation. We are understanding how important it is for us to help people uh, to improve their employability, how much it matters to participate in society. Um, I could go on about any one of these and why, why we are driven by it. But, but as libraries, I think we need to just pare back all of our rules and all of our procedures and just say, what's it for the sake of? And it's ultimately this. So my next one, next slide, uh, I sit on the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council for Canada. Really interesting sometimes to take a, take a bird's eye view and say, so what are these big issues that are moving and shaping our country? And, and stepping away from the micro of a library and saying, okay, so what about the erosion of culture and history? What, what opportunity do we have? Uh, where do we fit into um, our challenges in living and inhabiting, uh, inhabiting challenging environments. H how do we help manage the Earth's carrying capacity and living within that? What is life like, truth under fire in a post-fact world? These are, these are, any one of these is worth a real pause and we need to use our public institutions to respond to the, the major, major challenges that we face as a society. Um, and then of course, if we go globally, we get beyond Canada. Now we're talking about really the sustainable development goals for the world. And, you know, I could pull any one of these and say, right, I think the library can be part of the solution to this. And we really truly need to, to 
be confident that our energy and our resources are going to where the things that will ultimately create a sustainable earth. And that can be leveraging the sharing economy, that can be ensuring uh, peace and justice for all, it can be around partnerships, it can be about reducing inequalities. Um, really, every one of these has a, the role, the library has a role in responding. So it's really important that we think broadly about our potential impact and, and harness that. And I think, you know, at the end, it really is, you know, they might, people might come into the library looking for some information and ultimately they find, um, oh, next slide. Yeah, they find one another there and they actually probably find themselves there. I think we grow as people by reducing our isolation, connecting to others um, and embracing learning through our lifetimes. And, and I, you know, the library is free, equitable, inclusive space helps to achieve that for everybody. So that's my pitch, but now we really talk, right? <laughs> Awesome. Oh my gosh, how fantastic. Thank you to the both of you, Lawrence and Osa, for just like perfectly vibing off of one another and just bringing, um, yeah, a real understanding of how this can work. When we were on our call as a team on Friday, we talked about, um, well, we talked about everything because I think we just like got very excited about <laughs> the possibilities and, and we're inspiring one another. Um, we're going to transition into um, some Q&A and some just discussion. Um, I'd like to open up the floor for the audience to feel like they are more than welcome to participate in this. I, I would actually prefer knowing all the folks who are on the line um, and where you're all coming from and that you, you should be contributing. So please use the chat box if you have a question. You can either post it to everyone or direct it to myself or um, Jasmine specifically by using the toggle option. Um, but I'll, I'll start off just to throw out a question or two um, and then I'll, I'll let uh, Osa and Lawrence respond and, and then folks are welcome to jump in as well. Um, one of the things that fascinates me the most and, and has gotten me involved in libraries is this concept of ownership that you both spoke to. And um, certainly growing up in like a culture that really celebrated ownership as being efficient and being, you know, something to, if not aspire to, just to like, it's a part of our life and there wasn't a lot of imagination around it. And um, Osa, in one of your previous talks, you've mentioned that um, public spaces are too often actually exclusionary by design. And I think you gave police stations and city halls um, as potential examples, depending where you're coming from. And I'm curious, I mean, libraries do this so exceptionally well. And I'm wondering what opportunities you think libraries have in leading by example and teaching other public institutions to open up this public model and public ownership. Well, I do, I agree. I think we have an opportunity to set the bar for what the public should expect of public infrastructure. So, mm. um, and that's absolutely true. Our public dollars, you know, you and I build, have built hospitals and we've built police stations and we've built government buildings with our tax dollars and we have no access to them. Um, so I think public libraries actually are uniquely positioned to do it. I think the fact that, um, you know, we can, we can trust our public and model a kind of trust with our public that actually almost pushes other, other aspects of our community to do the same. So, um, you know, there, there are certainly in, in some countries, and this is true in Scandinavia, I don't know that there are too many Canadian examples where people can swipe into their library card and access their library even before it opens, right? So it is that idea of, yep, Full staff may not be in until 9 a.m., but if you need to pick up hold on your way to work or you need to print something out, because why, do, why are we all buying printers that we throw into the garbage because you know, the, the ink to refill them costs more than the printer costs when you bought it, right? So we've got some real, really big waste areas in our world. You know, but if, we had, if you knew you had 24 hour access to a printer at your library, you could send it in, you could go, you could print it out, you could get on with your day. There are, I think we do have a chance to model some of that. And certainly technology is emerging in a way that allows us to share the space even beyond opening hours. Um, but I think it's even in our attitudes. Right? We, we talk a lot in a modern library now about barriers. So, you know, in the old day, you couldn't get a library card if you didn't have a phone number in the old. And of course, somebody who doesn't have a phone number really, really needs us. Um, fines used to 
you know, stop people in their tracks for years. And now increasingly libraries are forgiving those fines or not even charging fines in the first place. So I do think we can model a respect for our public. Um, and, and that will push, you know, recreation providers and that'll push other levels of government to behave, to respect the public as opposed to sort of see the public as something to be managed. It's a different, it's a different lens of who it belongs to. Yeah, 100%. Um, I see some questions popping up, so I want to I wanna honor the invitation that I, I made. Um, Katie, I love this. So Katie's question, for if anybody can't see it, is how do school libraries fit into libraries reimagined? Um, and Jordan, we'll get to yours in a minute. Um, maybe I'll, I'll open this one up to the floor. Um, if folks who work with you specifically or, or do any collaboration with school or want to, um, if you're interested, you can kind of raise a hand and if not, we'll pass it back to our speakers. Okay. Um, Lawrence, maybe I'll check in with you if anything um, sort of like youth oriented or school oriented happens with the two libraries, either in Toronto or elsewhere. And also feel free to jump in as well. Uh, yeah, I think I can just say briefly that with the two library, we worked with uh, numerous schools in Toronto was trying to help them to either create small maker spaces or to bring that maker education to the classroom or collaborated with them, brought their, their students to us, visited their libraries. But uh, yeah, I think this uh, might be more of a, an, an also question. I know, I do know, I will just, again, just sort of briefly say that, I think the, like those school libraries are so important. That's where like the, the sharing is born in the mind. So it's, uh, so of course they're so important that they need to be part of this sort of reimagined larger strategy. But I thought still so. Yeah, I would, uh, school libraries are challenging because they, they fit within a school uh, infrastructure. So they sometimes have limitations on access because the school has to be open and there are rules around sort of how, um, how people access libraries. And I would say school libraries have unfortunately been historically underfunded. So we've done some consultation with local school libraries to, to provide support, but it's, it's, it's really difficult. I think what Lawrence talks about in terms of the makerspace seems to be actually the place of greatest intersection for us, that there is a movement within the schools around, around making and, and building a maker culture, whether that's, that's 3D printing or coding or, or other things. And we, that seems to be where we're having more intersection right now than in the traditional book library within the schools. Uh, certainly from a public library perspective, you know, we want to fill our libraries with teens and, and children as much as we can. And so, you know, there, we are always available to school age children, but the school library is a challenging thing. It's actually almost a cautionary tale because I think once things begin to disappear, it's very hard to bring them back. Um, and school libraries are certainly now often only open part-time and, and don't have the staffing that they did when I was a child. So. Um, they're in a tough spot, as are public libraries in other countries. So my, my position is we need to be ahead of that and be so valuable and so well-resourced. But I, I would say it's more difficult to be avant-garde within a school setting because of, of where it fits relative to the powers within the school that, than it is to be on the public, in the public library where we have relative, you know, a measure of autonomy because we report independently to public library boards uh, rather than through a traditional bureaucratic structure. Yeah, that's so interesting. It also really reminds me of um, both of you mentioned the future, um, whether we're paying a late fee to it or whether we're bringing kids um, into it. And I, yeah, I think the school lens is something that I, I haven't really spent much time thinking about, but would be a really great opportunity to just deepen the opportunity to for youth to to direct their own future vision of what a library would look like within their ecosystem in a school um but you mentioned uh in your answer also the the value of you know getting ahead of the curve and and, and convincing folks before this disappears so jordan i just want to highlight your question which was one i was thinking of as well um 
and to paraphrase, um, and hopefully I'm not taking this out of context, please correct me if I am, um, you know, in conversations with folks who, well, as I mentioned this in, in, um, in her presentation, the idea that we all come from different perspectives with different news sources, we're not necessarily coming from the same place. And so whether you're starting from the Google age or um, you know, you're trying to convince the city to change their permit or their building licensing to allow for some flexibility. Um, how do you, like, what are some of the best strategies and key messages that you can reiterate to either convince somebody or to just land that value really deeply with somebody? So I would say the, the biggest thing is to think about the lens through which the person you're trying to convince is, you know, mm. depending on who I'm talking to. Um, if I'm talking to folks around immigration, I talk about the work that the public library does in providing the settling in point for, for newcomers and in, into our community. So that's, that's big. If we're looking at economic development, um, you know, we had a big economic call to action a few years ago called the Now or Never Report that was really around the economic prosperity of our, of our province. The word library didn't appear once in that report, but I could speak to every single aspect of that, whether it was students who migrate here to study and wanting them to settle in off campus. You know, we've been named the best student hang. We beat out every campus pub at Central Library. So, you know, I can really make the case that we're key to getting students off campus and settled into the community, which then leads to the likelihood of, of staying here. Um, you know, we talk about the business uh, learnings that happen. So it really, if, it, if I'm talking about healthy seniors, you know, we are part of the solution to healthy aging. We have 800 volunteers, many of which are seniors who tell us that is their highlight of their week. And that's how they remain engaged and active in their community. So public health has increasingly identified and speaks publicly about our role in the well-being of our community, um, whether it's, it's supporting people at risk or whether it's, it's really creating opportunities that, that contribute to the social determinants of health. So I think it is about building, like connecting with your stakeholders um, and learning how to not just list the great things we do, but to, to frame what we do in the context of what problem they're trying to solve. I think that's the, the best thing we can do. Because if it's an environmental problem they're trying to solve, there are many, many things that the sharing economy of the library can do and that the educational opportunities through the library can offer in terms of raising people's awareness and changing behavior and even leveraging for our infrastructure for the public good. So it really depends on who I'm talking to and, and it, it can't be a canned elevator speech. It has to start mm -hmm. wide open and, and ready to respond to the issue that they they have focused on because mm -hmm. we're part of the solution to many many things which yeah yeah like you should, should the, the sdg slide being able to point to any one of the sustainable development goals and say this is where the library plays a role yeah mm -hmm. um lawrence i feel like this is a great question for you from teresa um mm -hmm. asking about the historic transition of owned goods from baby boomers downsizing um, she mentions her surprise to hear that two libraries are unsustainable without government funding. I'm curious if you have any thoughts in the response to that, and there might be some other people who can chime in too. Totally. I want to say one quick thing about uh, what also was saying before about um, framing the, the question on the key message and whatever. Of course, it's, it's a brilliant way to say it. And um, I want to say that like, Moving to Gothenburg as a 34 year old, like knowing no one just with my partner, very disorienting. And I found like my home at the reference library here. You know, this is like a place that you can just land in. And it happened when I moved to Canada also. The Toronto Public Library was like a place where I landed and connected me with the city. Anyway, that's just why I forever mm -hmm. love of libraries. With the, the ownership and the downsizing of the goods, well, it is really surprising how much stuff people have in their garages. Acquiring the actual inventory is not the major cost to these things. You just, you, you just get things thrown at you. You have to fix them, inventory them, put them in there. But there are like just massive real costs to having a physical location in a space. If you have it in an in a area that is useful to have it in, and close to a lot of people where a lot of people live, that's real estate is very expensive. Toronto real estate is extremely expensive. So that's a, that is a big cost. Then you have to have staff also. You can run it with volunteers, but 
really want to have sort of a few people, key people who are always there, just to have a, a, a Venn diagram overlap of the entire thing. So all of, you know, then you have to keep the lights on, you got to get the internet, you got to get the phone, the, all these real costs, they, they really add up. And uh, where do you get your money from? Well, you get it from membership fees, right? But you can't put those too high because you're, you are in competition with Home Depot, Rona, you know, whatever it is, you're, you are in competition with these places. You must undercut them. You must make buying membership at the tool library cheaper than going out there and just buying the drill. Oh, tool library is three hundred dollars. Forget it. I'm just going to go buy the drill, the hammer, the, the. You have to really, you have to hit that sweet spot, and it's between you know fifty and hundred dollars a year. You kind of get people in there. You can increase the price for sure, but you will lose people. So it's a bit of a, it's a challenge that we have struggled with, and many libraries struggle with. And how else do you do workshops? You can offer lots of workshops. I mean, I think the tool library right now with its da current downtown location, Spadina there is like doing a lot of things to work towards sustainability. And, and the, the formula is almost solved, you know, but you really need a maker space. You need a, a space where you can offer workshops and programming and build things and fix things and a real attraction to bring people in, in order to sort of make it sustainable. But as a standalone sort of location running only on membership fees, it's very challenging. It is something that many brains have smashed against in the past seven years of the existence of the library. And Molly is actually a bit of a conflict of interest here. She's the <laughs> board of directors for, <laughs> for the two libraries. Yeah. Question if you'd like, Molly. No, I mean, I think Lawrence is, is nailing it. Um, we, we do a lot of tool oriented puns at the library and sometimes I have to stop myself. Um, yeah, I think one of the things that when we had our call on Friday as a team, we talked about like, what are the opportunities for like, um, open source knowledge sharing, for resource sharing, for infrastructure sharing. And I think some of the more um, successful models financially that we've seen in tool libraries across North America, um, including like the Berkeley Library and now the Kitchener Tool Library uh, and Makerspace are um, embedded within their larger library system or like a city partnership. And that's huge. So when I see this incredible stuff coming out of um, Wesla's work and, and the whole team at um, in Halifax, that makes a lot of sense to me. That those are the costs that really prevent people from that imagination happening. Um, and so when we collaborate on what resources are held in other places, especially like rent is just, it just closes doors automatically for so many great things. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the big thing that I would add to that. I would just add to that, Molly. Um, it is, yeah, it, it is almost taking that infrastructure and saying, what do we layer on top of it? Mm -hmm. so tools are, are, you know, sometimes there are space restrictions and we need to think differently about how we build our libraries and how we move things between them. But, you know, some recent things that people have suggested to us, it's almost like, you know, you start this ball rolling, where is it going to roll to? But, you know, bicycles, right? If we want active transportation networks in our communities, how do we make cycling accessible to people? Um, Breast pumps is a recent one. You know, you need it for a period of time, and that that is a limited, relatively limited period of time. Um, so why why are people buying these, and and why are they gathering dust? And are there ways for us to partner um, to make sure that that again finances don't aren't a limiting reason for somebody mm -hmm. not to have access to the library that's in their interest of their good health? So. Uh, you know, I think libraries are increasingly open about it. I think we are evolving in our definition of what a library is. Uh, we talked a little bit on Friday about do we have to rename libraries as something else. And, and I think the part of library that has rung true from that picture of me when I was little to now is the free. Mm -hmm. And, you know, public library does say free. And that's a hard thing to, you know, we rename ourselves something else. That's going to be the most important, you know, most difficult message. So maybe let's redefine the edges, but let's remember that it, if for everyone and free and equitable access and democracy, it's a, those are pretty good foundation pieces. And great last sentence to wrap up on. Um, that's, yeah, I feel super energized by this conversation, which is not surprising because I talk about libraries too much. Um, <laughs> 
Katie and Jordan introduced, I thank you for your questions. Um, I think that really shaped our conversation really nicely. And Lawrence and Osa, I'm so grateful that you were um, ready to just jump in to this with me. Um, so thanks for joining. We're gonna send out a follow-up email that has the recording of uh, this webinar and we'll have sort of a summary and information on uh, our next webinar. We have this monthly, it's the last Tuesday of every month. So our next one will be on March 24th and it will be focused on food and land, which is another thing near and dear to my heart. And the idea of how do we operate or reimagine the commons when it relates to uh, land and how we grow and share our food. Um, so with that, just one last thank you. Thank you to Jasmine for holding down the fort and for everybody for participating and have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday. Thanks for inviting us, Molly. Of course. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye now.